go into our first speaker, which is Dr. Randy Martin. Randy is a um, associate professor at um, Utah State University with their um, Department of Environmental and Civil Engineering. Um, Randy has been involved with many different air quality projects um, through the Utah um, Water Resource Laboratory as, and also um, in collaboration with the, the Utah um, Space Dynamics Lab. So with that, Randy, um, please talk to us about um, ambient ammonia, air quality, and health impacts. Okay, thank you. I'm going to apologize first of all too if I start coughing through this. Uh, I've got a bit of a summer cold, but I've got my herbal tea right here and I'll try to work through it. So anyway, yes, I'm going to talk about ambient ammonia and air quality and health impacts today. This slide you see now was supposed to have a little animation where it says ammonia kind of back and forth coming soon to regulations in your area because it is an up and coming issue and I think we'll see a lot more of it in the future. As you can also see on this first slide is my contact information if you would like to ask any questions separately. So with that, let's get right into it. Uh, this is the outline of what we're going to cover. Just a quick definition of what exactly gaseous ammonia is, where it comes from, uh, some of the health and welfare issues dealing with gas, gaseous ammonia, the sources and production of gaseous ammonia, particularly as it relates to agriculture. And then we're going to look at a case study of Cache Valley, which is on the Utah-Idaho border, which just happens to be where I live and a little bit brief of current ammonia air quality regulations, which I guess will set up the, really the next webcast, and then just tie everything up with a summary. Okay, first of all, the nerdy chemistry stuff. What is ammonia? Well, it's nitrogen with three hydrogen molecules bonded onto it. Uh, it's less dense than air. It has a molecular weight of about 17, whereas air has a molecular weight of about 30. Uh, it's a major species in the biogeochemical nitrogen cycle of our planet, so it's a very important compound. It's water soluble, especially as the water becomes more acidic. And just uh, for your reference, natural rainwater is by definition a bit acidic, usually has a pH between 5 and 5.5, so it is readily soluble in rainwater or uh, natural water bodies. Uh, gas ammonia is also the most abundant base gas in the atmosphere. So this is the gas that will act with any acidic species that might be in the atmosphere. One of the things about atmospheric ammonia, it is relatively slow to oxidize. In other words, to convert to the oxidized species. Uh, normal oxidation reaction is about two and a half months long, so it's very slow. However, gaseous ammonia will react with uh, like I said before, acidic species, particularly nitrate and sulfate in the atmosphere, to form particulate matter, and that's what we're going to focus on here. Ammonia is also very sticky. It deposits very easily, either in the wet or dry form. When it's in the wet or dry form, or in the wet form or the particulate form, it actually exists as ammonium, which is NH4 with a positive charge on it. Um, when you're talking about the depositional velocity or the particle phase, the actual lifetime in the atmosphere is only a few hours to a few days. So once it gets into that form, it can deposit very quickly. Okay, so why are we concerned about ammonia? Well, ammonia does have some documented health effects as well as welfare effects. And by welfare effects, I basically mean anything that's not a human health effect. Uh, ammonia is basically a wet tissue irritant, as it shows here on the slide, where it primarily attacks the eyes, the nose, the throat. And generally, it's just an irritation at most levels. It can, however, have some serious consequences at higher concentrations. You can have corneal and skin burns, as well as blistering, interocular pressure, which can then lead to glaucoma, uh, coughing, much like I have today, but that's not ammonia-related, as well as uh, pulmonary and laryngeal edema, which is fluid buildup, chest pains, which comes from that fluid buildup, and if the concentrations are high enough, you can end up with pink, frothy sputum. Uh, OSHA, as well as other regulatory agencies, have set standards for human health, and you can see them here on the board. Uh, they have an eight-hour permissible exposure limit of 50 parts per million. The American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists recommends a slightly lower level of 25 parts per million over that same eight-hour exposure limit, with a 15-minute exposure limit of 35 parts per million. Now, I did find some other references for higher concentrations. NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, uh, has an immediate danger to life at a health level of 300 parts per million. Um, and the CDC, I found they had a 
what they call their lethal concentration low limit uh, for a five minute average of 5,000 parts per million. So there are regulated values and most of these values you're not going to see too frequently. Uh, 50, 25 parts per million is not uncommon in some agricultural housing situations though. Animal health issues, as you see on this next slide, are very similar to the human health issues. They breathe air just like we do. They have the wet, uh, the wet tissues just like we do. So you can look through that list and see that a lot of their same effects are the same things we would see, except they do, uh, there are studies that show reduced weight gain in, in swine and poultry in particular at modest levels, 50 to 100 parts per million for the swine, 25 parts per million for poultry. Um, they also, across the board on all animal species, you tend to have uh, reduced resistances to infectious diseases. And I did come across a few studies showing that there's actually lesions that form, particularly in swine, on uh, at moderate levels, 50 parts per million or so of ammonia. So most of the recommendations are to keep uh, animal housing units below 20 parts per million, although some references will try to push that down to 10 to 15 parts per million. Um, welfare issues. This is where ammonia gets interesting from a regulatory standpoint. Is, and this is something Dr. Davis is probably going to talk about, but excessive ammonia or ammonium, the NH4 version of it, can lead to what's called eutrophication in water bodies, excessive nutrients, in this case nitrogen, which could then cause excessive plant growth. That can create algal blooms, which then results in redu reduced dissolved oxygen, which then can kill off the water body system. You can also get soil acidification uh, through the microbial nitrification of ammonia to nitrate. But what I'm here to talk about is this last welfare issue, and that's the contribution of ammonia to fine particle formation. And we're going to get more detail on this next slide. Uh, ammonia, and as we mentioned before, will readily react with gaseous acids, especially sulfuric acid and nitric acid, to form fine particles. And by regulatory definition, fine particles, we mean those less than 2.5 microns in diameter. The most favored reaction is for sulfuric acid, which is formed from oxides of nitrogen, or I mean oxides of sulfur, which are emitted from the combustion of any sulfurous fuel, such as diesel fuel or coal, will combine with the ammonia and form ammonium bisulfate. If there's extra ammonia around, which there usually is, uh, that ammonium bisulfate will then go on and form ammonium sulfate. That ammonium sulfate then is a particle. You take those gases and you form particles. That is an irreversible reaction, meaning it is very stable. That particle is very stable at almost all atmospheric conditions we'll ever see. Now, if there is additional excess ammonia or if there's not sufficient sulfates present, the ammonia will react with nitric acid. And nitric acid is formed from oxides of nitrogen, which are common in any combustion process. That reaction forms ammonium nitrate. And that reaction happens to be an equilibrium reaction. So uh, there will be a balance between the gas phase and the particle phase. Uh, however, that equilibrium reaction will strongly shift over to the right uh, at cold temperatures or high humidities. For example, I've got listed there on the, the figure that a change from 25 degrees C, so a warm summertime temperature, say around 78 degrees Fahrenheit, to zero degrees C, wintertime temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, will shift or favor the right-hand side, the ammonium nitrate, by a factor of 100. So the colder it gets, the more particles it will form. By looking at these reactions, and these are admittedly somewhat simplified, you can see that the control of ammonia-based PM is going to be highly dependent on ammonia controls. It may also be dependent on the controls of the sulfate and nitrate, but ammonia is going to be one of the key species in there as well. Just to kind of take a sidestep here, I want to make sure everybody understands what PM2.5 is and how it's regulated. By legal definition, as written in the Code of Federal Regulations, PM2.5 is all particulate matter suspended in the ambient air, so that's the outside air, which is less than or equal to 2.5 microns in aerodynamic diameter, which is about 1 40th the diameter of a human hair, so it's pretty small. There's some national ambient air quality standards. There's a 24-hour standard of 35 micrograms per cubic meter. That was just recently lowered from 65. Uh, and that's reported what's called the 98th percentile. That's somewhat key to remember. The 98th percentile simply means if you take 100 measurements, 100 days worth of measurements, you get to throw out the highest two and you regulate at the third highest. And then you average that over three years and that's your regulatory or design value. 
There is also a sta an annual standard of 15 micrograms per cubic meter. Okay, why is PM2.5 important? Well, simply put, it can get down into the deep lung tissue. It can get all the way down into the alveoli sacs. There have been many, many studies to try to assess exactly what these dangers are. Uh, Arden Pope out of BYU here in Utah is one of the key uh, investigators in this field, and he's reported that you get an 8% increase in lung cancer risk for every 10 microgram increase in PM2.5. Uh, it's been often said that this is similar to living with somebody who uh, smokes cigarettes. Now you can see the other uh, issues there, haze issues as well as deposition, uh, depositional issues, but I won't go into those because I know we need to keep cruising along here. Okay, where does ammonia come from? Well, this is a fairly recent uh, plot of U.S. gas phase ammonia emissions. And you can look at the various pie slices right there, but the thing I will point out is about 88% of the ammonia is attributable to the agricultural uh, industry, with about 15% or so being uh, due to crops, that's basically fertilizer application, and then 73% uh, attributable to livestock. And you can see the breakdown there. Uh, swine, 13%, poultry, 20%, uh, cattle, total of about 40%, and then sheep, goats, and horses, uh, 1% to 2%. Uh, I wanted to show this map very quick. This is the National Acid Deposition Program map that shows the three-year average of where the ammonia is deposited in the United States. And what you can see there, right along the Midwest, that high, dense agricultural area, there's a lot of deposition of ammonia, ammonium in this case. Also, I want to point out that up there in the corner of Utah, which is where I am right now, uh, we're also very high in ammonia deposition. And that's, we're a drier area than the Midwest, but we have a very densely packed uh, agriculture right in this little valley I'm in. Okay, so how is ammonia produced from, from the ag industry? Well, the majority of the emissions as we say, come from livestock, and it really or originates from a mixture of the feces and urine. Um, nitrogen itself is excreted as either urea or ureic acid or undigested protein. Urea and ureic acid is emitted in the urine of mammals and poultry. And those compounds are converted by an enzyme, urease, uh, which is present in the manure. So if you have intimate contact, which the vet science guys love that term, intimate contact between the urine and feces, you will get that conversion of the ureic acid and the urea to ammonia. Um, and I should point out this last bullet under that subheading there, gaseous ammonia favored at neutral to basic pHs, that's a correct sentence. If you have an older version of this, this presentation, it, it'll say at acidic pHs. It should be basic pHs. So if you have basic conditions, you're going to produce ammonia gas. If you have acidic conditions, you will produce ammonium, which will stay in the manure and the uh, feces mix. Uh, the complex undigested proteins, the, essentially the food that passes through the system, that can also be converted to ammonia uh, by microbial activity, but it's much, much slower on the order of months to years. Um, ammonia, as we have, is also known, can be released just simply through volatilization of waste storage, transport, and disposal. So this would be like fertilizer application or the movement of liquid or solid waste. Okay, let's quickly talk about the Cache Valley. Since Ron ran over my time, I'm going to run over a little bit on this as well, but I'll go through this quick. Cache Valley in northern Utah, you see a little map of it there on the right. Uh, we cross between northern Utah and southern southeastern Idaho. Idaho. This little green line around here, that represents an elevation of about 5,200 feet. So you can see this valley is almost completely surrounded by mountains. We've got a little outlet right here, but these mountains go up to about 10,000 feet, and the valley's at about 4,500 feet. Uh, we have about a population of about 110,000 spread out over about 20 little cities, and agriculture is a dominant portion of our economy, contributing $190 million in 2004 thing to point out is we also have about 106,000 head of cattle, 7,400 sheep, 7,500 swine, 7, swine, and about 1.5 million chickens in the valley. And the big issue here is we have unacceptably high wintertime PM2.5. Our recorded 24-hour high has been 
up to 137.5 micrograms per cubic meter, so almost four times the national standard. We have had episodes where we have actually been the worst polluted area in the country. You can see down there our three-year average is 40.4 right now, which is still above the level of 35. Just to show you what the Cache Valley looks like, it's a very nice little valley in the wintertime. This is a beautiful day, uh, February 25th, 2002. Oops, wrong button. This is a not-so-beautiful day, uh, February 13th, 2004. The PM 2.5 on this day was 100.3 micrograms per cubic meter, so about three times the standard, and the valley was just socked in. If you went above that green line on that previous map, got above the inversion height, you had uh, beautiful blue skies, but down in the valley, this is what we faced. So why? Well, very quickly, Cache Valley has unfavorable me wintertime meteorology. We have frequent high pressure systems or stagnant air. We get lots of inversions. We have snow-covered surfaces, which means we all our incoming solar radi radiation just reflects off. And we don't have enough energy to break the inversions. And we have cold temperatures well below 32 Fahrenheit and high humidity. So what does that mean? We strongly favor the production of ammonium nitrate particles. Uh, our valley is also enclosed, as I show you on that map, so the air that's here stays trapped. And then we just have the abundant local sources of the precursor compounds. We have 85,000 vehicles in the valley, so we have a good source of oxides of nitrogen. Our vehicle fleet here tends to be older than the, than the national norm, as well as we have a greater percentage of pickup trucks and diesel engines. And then finally, we have no vehicle inspection maintenance program here in the valley as it stands. And then, of course, we've got lots of agriculture, which means we have lots of ammonia. If you look at this pie chart here on the bottom, this shows uh, the chemical composition of our PM2.5. And, and I'd just like to quickly point out that about 75% of our particles are made up of ammonium salts, either ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate. And on high days, that is when we get up to those 100 micrograms per cubic meter, the ammonium nitrate portion ap approaches 20 or 80 to 95 percent of the particulate matter. So we know ammonium nitrate is our problem. So one important question is, where does all the ammonia come from here in the Cache Valley? Well, we've done several studies, and what you see here are three graphs of our source apportionment area there on the left. My little arrow. Oops, where my arrow go? There it is. Arrows. So these are all our ammonia sources. The bigger the circle, uh, the larger the source. So you can see we've got quite a few down the Utah side and some fairly large ones up on the Idaho side. What we then did is we plugged all these ammonia emissions from this graph into a model and it calculated out what we expected our ammonia concentrations to be. Notice it doesn't, our model doesn't go much up into Idaho simply because we didn't have actual physical receptors up in that part of Idaho. The little black triangles, that represents where we had actual measurements, and you see those results on this third graph. So what this is showing us is we've got a pretty good handle of where our ammonia is coming from and which facilities are producing most of the ammonia, which is then impacting the valley. So if we do need to go to controls, we know where to go. What's the current state of ammonia regulations? Well, right now, there's not much ammonia regulations, at least based on the Federal Clean Air Act or its amendments. Ammonia is considered a hazardous substance under a CERCLA and EPCRA, and only those facilities that emit greater than 100 pounds per day are required to report. Some states have initiated specific ammonia regulations. California kind of started it all with, uh, in 2003 with their Senate Bill 70, which basically said that uh, CAFOs are no longer exempt from permitting requirements, and since then they've passed more regulations. And Idaho has kind of jumped on board with the uh, ammonia permitting program. And then finally, just in summary, agriculturally derived ammonia is becoming increasingly important in both regional and local air quality issues, especially in the photochemical formation of PM2.5, also known as secondary PM. Um, another issue that can't be ignored are nuisance odors. odors. This is becoming particularly more important as the urban and rural interface continues to blur a bit. Uh, I think we're going to see more just on nuisance and not just purely on particle formation. And then finally, I just want to make the note that current and future regulations must be based on quantifiable, reliable, and defensible emission factors. Uh, the historical emission factors are relatively few and are limited in U.S. applications. And for the last decade, as is going to be on July 18th, there's been a lot more uh, studies in the U.S. Uh, centered on 
national process-based emission studies, for example, the National Air Emissions Monitoring Study, as well as numerous other investigators across the country. With that, I'll throw out my bibliography slides where I've got most of my information from for this, as well as eight years of research here, uh, and uh, pass it back to Ron. Thank you, Randy. Mm -hmm. I hope every can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Next, we want to understand another um, pathway for the fate of this um, complex ammonia um, where Randy talked about the ambient air issues. Um, there's another pathway, and that is what happens um, when those particles um, slow down in the atmosphere and, and deposit. Um, so with that, Jessica Davis. Um,